chat, 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 chat. <laughs> Good people, great people, God's people. What's happening? Welcome to the second episode of the second season of The Antidote. Presented by yours truly, Professor Odin. Um, today we are live on both TikTok and YouTube. Um, and as y'all can see, you know what I'm saying, we... We got the whole thing going. We got the whole thing flowing. You feel me? Um, and hopefully, because I'm, I'm looking at my my OBS studio, and it, it looks like there's a small lag. I hope there's not a small lag on YouTube. But either way, um, today we're going to be talking about gender role expectations, um, how it is that those gender role expectations can lead to uh, not only just uh, – I was going to use the word dehumanization, but I felt like dehumanization was too strong of a word. Right, mm, dehumanizing or dehumanization is appropriate in particular situations, but I feel uh, minimization and invalidation of partner trauma was a more appropriate way to go about it. Right, so before we get into it, as always, I'm gonna tell y'all about my emotional intelligence university. Uh, my emotional intelligence university is a group coaching offering that um, is replacing basically my one-on-one -on -one slots because I have two pre-existing contracts with two other agencies that allow me to keep my one-on-one -on -one slots filled. So uh, it's very difficult to get a one-on-one -on -one slot with me, especially at this point in time. Um, and if they are or if they do open up, there are already people who basically are on a waiting list to get into those slots. So what it is that I've done is that I've created online communities for people to come in and continue to increase their emotional intelligence, to continue to uh, further their emotional intelligence journeys, and continue to learn emotional intelligence techniques, emotional intelligence skills, and to have conversations around increasing quality of life, utilizing emotional intelligence. Now, when you come into these spaces with me, um, my courses are focused on mental health, building love, building awareness, and building wealth. So in each one of my courses, we go over multiple facets of um, self-actualization, multiple facets of black psychology, multiple facets of emotional intelligence in the self, emotional intelligence and in dating. Um, I have another course coming out fall of 2023 where it'll be emotional intelligence and um, sex and sensuality. All of these things are built from an Afrocentric perspective. So basically, I'm the HW, I'm sorry, I'm the HW, I'm the HBCU to the PWIs that's out here in terms of personal development. You understand what I'm saying? If you come into my spaces, you will be taught from the perspective of, once again, an Afrocentric professor because I do have my master's degree, so I'm able to teach at the bachelor's level and at the community college level, which is the reason why I call myself Professor Odie. I do not misrepresent myself as having a PhD. I also don't misrepresent myself as having an individual license, which is the reason why I'm an emotional intelligence and emotional regulation coach. Um, shout out to Gwendolyn Ismatu. She already know what's up. Uh, at times, licensing, regulation, things of that nature can put you in somewhat of a pickle or somewhat of a limbo space. So in order for me to, once again, capitalize on me being able to give you all these types of skills and engage you all in these types of dynamics, engage you all in these types of group dynamics. I would love for you all to once again, check out the link in my bio and my TikTok, check out the link in my bio and my Instagram, come and join these groups for you to be able to once again, continue to increase your emotional intelligence and continue to have conversations with me. Oh, I almost forgot. We have weekly Zoom, we have weekly Zoom classes where we discuss what you've learned in the uh, what you've learned in the modules if you are in the love classroom or if you are in the lecture series which is the premium group uh, I actually teach you the modules right so I have two different group offerings um, the first one is the love virtual classroom and the love virtual classroom is the um, basic option and the basic option is you will be connected to the book club you'll have two uh, access to two of my courses, um, self-actualization within black psychology and um, emotional intelligence in itself. You'll also get a free copy of my book, Break It Down, uh, a manifestation manual for black folks. And in the love classroom, it's self-paced and it's self-taught. So you go into the love classroom, you go through the modules, you read the book. And every week, you know, we discuss 
what you found, we discuss what it is that you've learned through the modules. Uh, we is basically a study group, right? And inside of that study group, for the people who have asked me about book lists, for the people who have asked me what it is that I do, I still do have the book club. The book club is just wrapped into the love classroom, right? So the book, uh, the love classroom meets twice a week, Mondays and Wednesdays. And once again, on Mondays, we discuss the book of the month that we're reading. The book of the month this month is all about love by Bell Hooks. And on Wednesday, we discuss what it is that people have learned in the modules. Now, the premium group is called the lecture series. And the lecture series is a year-long engagement with me. It is a year-long group engagement. And in this year-long group engagement, I walk you through every single course that I have. And I teach you on a weekly basis how to incorporate these things into your life, right? You can choose to engage into the book club if you want to, but those classes specifically are on Wednesdays and they're every week. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking about making those classes like an hour and a half instead of an hour so that, once again, we actually have the ability to really dig deep into emotional intelligence concepts for you to be able to do what it is that you would like to do in your life and through your emotional intelligence journey, right? So that's the Emotional Intelligence University. Once again, go check it out. Link is in my bio on my TikTok. Link is also in my bio on my Instagram. Um, and also on my Insta Actually, if you click on my Instagram links, uh, all three of those links have been updated to the Emotional Intelligence University, the Love Classroom, and the Spotify link. So if you want to go follow me on Spotify, that link is in my tic uh, that link is in my Instagram bio. You dig what I'm saying? So once again, everywhere we all can find me, all of my links are in my digital real estate, which is in my TikTok bio and in my Instagram bio. So yeah. That's where you all can go find me. That's where you all can engage with, in coaching with me. That's where you all can go subscribe to the, 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 the Spotify. That's where you can find me on YouTube. All that good stuff. But without further ado, we're going to get into this conversation after I find this bottle cap. There it is. Okay. So the name of today's episode is Know Your Role and Shut Your Mouth. Right? The reason why I named it Know Your Role and Shut Your Mouth is because, oh, they say the volume is low on YouTube. All right, let's try to get this situated. Um, the courses are hosted on Thinkific. That's one, two, for my people on YouTube. Is the volume a bit better? If so, then we good. If not, um, we may or may not. You dig what I'm saying? But uh, we still going to get into it. Now, um, give me a quick second, you guys. The courses are hosted on Thinkific. The courses are hosted on Thinkific, and on Thinkific, uh, we have, once again, the Emotional Intelligent course. The We have the um, two group classrooms. I'm sorry, y'all. I had to slow down because I had to make sure that everything was going the way that it needed to go. Uh, but yes, it's hosted on Thinkific. Uh, the Love Virtual Classroom is hosted on Hotmart. And the reason why I have the Love Virtual Classes, the Love Virtual Classroom hosted on Hotmart is so that we can, once again, have a separate group entity away from, once again, like the Facebooks and stuff like that. You have your own individual group. But I want to start talking about, once again, what's going on in today's podcast episode. Somebody said that the volume was low on YouTube. I may have to fix that in post. We're going to figure it out. But got to get back to the live stream. Now, today's live stream is called Know Your Role and Shut Your Mouth, right? The reason why it's called Know Your Role and Shut Your Mouth is because, once again, I firmly, 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 firmly believe that a number of our relationships are mired by this perception that we have to behave in a particular way in a relationship, right? It's mired by this perception that, yo, as a man or as a woman, I have to behave in this particular way or I have to do this uh, role in this way, right? I don't think we take the time to really break down how much damage that does to our relationships. Like, I really don't think we take the time to examine that, right? That's one. Two, I don't think we take the time to examine how it is that we have been socialized to excuse me, process trauma or engage with trauma or enmesh ourselves in trauma because of our particular gender roles, right? Or because of our particular gender expressions. What do I mean? Hmm. Hmm. 
believe it or not, believe it or not, I've been working with a lot of men recently. Because <laughs> people swear up and down. They swear up and down that I don't work with men, that I don't help men, X, Y, Z, A, B, and C, right? I've been working with men extensively. And one of the things that I hear men say a lot is that I feel as if though I am an afterthought or I feel as if though I'm a second thought, right? And when we begin exploring that, we begin to understand that men have been socialized to, once again, believe that their emotions do not matter or their emotional needs do not matter. When we position ourselves in this particular type of dynamic, what we begin to see is resentment grow from this partner because they are at a crossroads, right? They are at a, a impasse. They feel as if though their emotional needs are not getting met, but because they are a man or because they identify as a man, they say or they say outwardly or they present outwardly as if though they do not have emotional needs to be met. Okay. Women, on the other hand, have been socialized to believe that, once again, a lot of their femininity is based upon how it is that they can, they can take care of and provide for, in a lot of ways, nurturing environments for others. Right? Within that same space, women will also say, I feel as if though I'm an afterthought. I feel as if though I do not get thought about. I feel as if though, you know, I, I am not being validated for what it is that I'm doing. Over time, when I sit and I think about how it is that we position these conversations, I keep saying to myself, like, yo, we're literally having two sides of the same conversation. We are literally talking about the same concept on both sides. We are literally speaking about how it is and where it is we would like to be validated without identifying how it is that our perception of a gender role or our perception of somebody's job in a relationship causes us to overlook how it is that we can either A, support them in that role or support them in that quote unquote job or B, we end up saying things like, you want me to thank you for what it is that you're supposed to do. Or you're supposed to do this. I can't stand when people say that, G. <clears throat> I can't stand when people say that. I can't stand it. Right? I cannot stand when people say, you are supposed to do something. I'm not supposed to do shit. Well, wake up. Eat. Do. <laughs> pay my taxes, pay my bills, and die. That's it. I'm not and respect my mom and my dad. I'm not. I'm not supposed to do nothing else, nothing, right? When you say that is what you're supposed to do, that is an expectation and that is an entitlement to that person's autonomy based upon your perception of their gender role. That's asinine. That's asinine. You believe that you have the authority and the license to give them a job or give them a task. Or employ them with something based upon how it is that they present. Right? They have a role. They have a, a responsibility. Okay. I don't even want to argue that point right now. Let's let's walk down this road. Let's let's play the script all the way through, right? Even if that is your role. Let's assume complete traditionalism. Man goes out, makes the money, gets the paper, come back home to a woman who don't do nothing but pop out babies, make sandwiches, and do sexual things, right? Let's completely, as, as, as patriarchal as we can make this, right? Cool. Cool. How do you regulate when you do not perform this role well? Or how did we teach regulation when these roles were not performed well? Let's, let's, let's walk down this road, shall we? Because I don't think we honestly, once again, talk about how it is that gender roles 
can potentially invalidate somebody's autonomy and license to move in their own space based upon not their internalization of how it is that this traditional thing should be done, your perception. You are projecting your expectations and perceptions onto somebody. But let's continue to walk down this road. In the past, how we have been taught to regulate dysregulation in traditional households was to do what? How were we how did we regulate households in the past? It was to do what? It was to cause physical harm to our partners. We are not too far removed from a generation where abuse of women was legal. Actually, I think in one state it still is as long as you do it on the courthouse steps. It's one of them Fun fact laws, right? One of them weird and wacky laws. What men don't understand, what men do not understand, is that the same way we want to be able to, like, once again, control and I, 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 woo, woo, that traditional dynamic or that traditional archetype in the household is contextualized by a community that will ostracize you if you do not perform Appropriately. You can't have one without the other dog. You can't run your house like a man without the other men in your community running you out of the community if they don't perceive you as a man. Getting control of your wife was one layer of the traditional masculine infrastructure or the traditional masculine hierarchy. That was one layer. Let you not have let you not have a job that had a pension. Right? Let you curse a little bit too much. Let you smoke reefer. Let you go down to those juke joints. Let you be a heathen. A lot of y'all would not be traditional men in that de- in that regard or that degree. Right? So when we begin talking about this traditionalism, precisely which traditionalism are we speaking of? Precisely whose traditions are we calling on? Because most of the black families that I know, while the outward presentation was traditional, the inward workings of the family very rarely were. Right? We as black folks, we try to do that. We try to do that traditional masculine ideology thing, that whole... Like, the woman is supposed to do this and the man is supposed to do this. But once we really get married, like, have y'all ever noticed that black couples who exist or who black married couples who have been together for more than, I think that golden round number is like 25. They begin to recognize that they are not necessarily stuck with this person, but this is the person that they married. This is the person that they chose. Right? So at a point, it no longer if 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 the if the if the marriage is healthy, it no longer becomes about who is what person. It becomes about what can this person do, what is this person good at, what does this person do, and what are they good at? I come from a family where on the matriarchal side, the men built houses, but on the patriarchal side, the men cook. My father, my cousin, are both excellent cooks. You talk about a kitchen sink, a kitchen sink cook, my father is one of them. You dig what I'm saying? It's a partnership. It's strength-based. Right? And when some men hear that word partnership, like I saw it in real time, because I was on Revolt TV News, I saw it in real time. This man was like, I think his name is Anton Davis. I'm like, you're not a partner. I'm the man in a relationship. Pressure's made for shoulders and not heels. Me, man, I leader. Okay. What happens when you take on all that stress? What happens when you take on all that leadership? And you die 15 years earlier because you don't know how to regulate your emotions appropriately. Oh, I work out. I eat healthy. That's fantastic. 
your cortisol and adrenal levels will still take you out this motherfucker through cardiac arrest. You'll still stroke out. And then you then you really won't be you really won't be able to move. What happens if you have a stroke based upon you not being able to regulate your blood pressure between you being mad all the time and you going to the gym? So now half you you're experiencing partial you're experiencing partial movement ability in one or two quadrants of your body. Now what? Now your shoulders can't handle no pressure. Are you still a man? Once again, traditional masculine ideology in a lot of ways is ableist. It is. It does not include our brothers in wheelchairs. It doesn't. It doesn't include our brothers who have had traumatic brain injuries. It doesn't. It doesn't include our brothers who are neuroatypical. It doesn't. It does not. Right? So what does this mean? How are we moving within these spaces or how are we utilizing these roles in order to, once again, invalidate or minimize people in these relationships? Women, right? Uh, I am a bell hooks fanatic. I'll read bell hooks up and down, round and round. So once again, uh, book of the month, this month, I don't know if y'all have ever read it, but all about love. I need y'all to get it, read it. You feel me? Continue, but in the book, she used a term that I had not heard up until that point. She said, patriarchal femininity, and I said, whoo, whoo. I mentioned take on a situation with a mom and a son who defended her. That's a little off topic, but um, yeah, win, uh, play stupid games and win stupid prizes. They dropped all charges against her and the mama. I'm sorry, him and the mama. And I'm from Chicago, bro. What? Like I said, play goofy games, win goofy prizes. Because you really think, just real quick sidebar, you really think I'm not finna do that and you you done deck my mama three times? Come on, G. Once again, is it a gender role? Is it hyper-masculine? Is it appropriate? Once again, I'm not one of them people who be out in the field. But at the same time, if my role is a protector and provider, and I got something to protect where I can provide some action, provisions will definitely provide the provisions will definitely be provided, my boy. Cause you out here being real goofy and we gotta line your ass up. Once again, I don't be in the field. That don't mean I once again, come on now. So, going back to the conversation, when we talk about these roles and how it is that it, 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 it can have the impact of invalidating or minimizing somebody's experience on the women's side, patriarchal femininity, right? Hmm, actually, I appreciate that example. That's an example of an expectation of patriarchal femininity, right? The expectation to risk life and limb to protect my body. That's an expectation of patriarchal femininity, right? That's the reason why for a lot of men, when they say, so you expect me to just risk my life for you to not be able to regulate yourself? I agree with that, 1,000%. Because patriarchal, toxic patriarchal femininity makes you, makes you dumb, like it makes you it makes you have to present as if though you're stupid so a man can come save you. What? I've never agreed with that. And that that quite frankly stuff like that does not turn me on. It makes me flaccid. I can't stand that. Whew. Mm. I I cannot stand a woman who has expectations of me that are rooted in patriarchal femininity. I can't stand it like Allow me to perform those things for you, but do not expect them from me, right? Conversely, conversely, patriarchal femininity invalidates and minimizes women who do not subscribe to it. So once again, if you are in a relationship with a man who believes that he's a patriarchal man when really he 
not, but he's expecting a patriarchally feminine woman, and this woman does not subscribe to patriarchal femininity. Now there's a bunch of you're not a real woman. Now this woman who does not subscribe to patriarchal femininity is questioning her femininity. Why? Why? Because you don't want to make this man a sandwich at 2 o'clock in the morning? Why? Why? Because cause, 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 cause you, you don't, you don't want to give up your career for a baby right now? Why? Why? Because you, you're, you're, not the most, you're not the most nurturing person because of your own set of traumas that make it difficult for you to be open and vulnerable. So that make me too masculine? Yeah. Yeah. Once again, the expectations of the patriarchy are the expectations of traditional masculine ideologies in partnered relationships, specifically cis hetero partnered relationships, usually rely on the invalidation of trauma in order to force somebody into a role. They don't care what you went through. Just do what the fuck I asked you to do. Know your role and shut your mouth. I don't care what you went through. Leave that at the door. We got to perform this on the stage, baby. Right? So once again, a lot of men are intimidated by my intelligence. I have two master's degrees and dating is challenging. Are we shaming women for guarding their wombs, I wonder? Okay. So, two things. Isn't that most romantic? Isn't that most relationships not just romantic ones? So for people on YouTube, I'm reading my TikTok comments as they're coming in. Um, it helps to uh, increase the conversation. And for the people on Spotify who are listening, that's also what it is that I'm doing. So a lot of men are intimidated by intelligence. I have two master's degrees in dating and challenging. Yes, because patriarchal femininity requires you to be dumb. Patriarchal femininity encourages you to be stupid. It encourages you to fawn. It encourages you to not go seek out resource for yourself. Because patriarchal femininity requires men to do all of that work. The patriarchy requires men to do all of that work. Right? When the reality of the situation is both of you all as human beings are completely and totally capable of doing similar, not the same, but similar things. Not the same, similar. Oh, I can't lift this much, says who? Is it that you can't lift that much or has society told you that being a strong and bulky woman is not attractive and you therefore internalize that as something that you cannot do? Your muscles cannot grow to the same size as men's. That don't mean that they can't grow. <laughs> that don't mean that you can't be strong out here. I'm confused. Right? With men, oh, you can't do too much self-care, otherwise you gay. My friend Watts. So you are, you are telling me, you are trying to tell me that this life cannot be about enjoyment. I have to go. So far, so far, so far. My friend shut up there. Well, if I go get a massage, I'm no longer, man. That's crazy. If I get a, a daiquiri, I'm no longer, man. That's crazy. Right? That's, that's insanity. Right. Because as a man, I need more time to emotionally process or because as a man, I have the same level of emotional intelligence as you. Now I'm sassy because as a man, I'm asking for reciprocity from you. Y'all, do y'all do see how this is working against us in both ways? Do you see how very quickly your internalization of these particular roles can lead you inadvertently to invalidate your partner? We must discard them. Either that or we must get into relationships with people who are consenting to the amount of traditional ideologies that we want to engage in. So in other words, if you feel like you are a traditional masculine, stop trying to beat a modern, stop trying to beat a modern feminine into that role. Similarly, if you feel like you are a traditional feminine, stop trying to shame a modern masculine into that role. Stop it. Because if I sit here as a black man and a black African man and tell both of y'all that basically both of y'all are using white supremacist tactics against one another in order to make you all engage in what the capitalism or what white supremacy identifies as a nucleic family, 
Now I'm a hotel. But if I tell you that most of the gender roles that you're trying to make each other perform come from the etiquettes, the social etiquettes of 19th century Victorian Europe, and I will continue to say this from the mountaintop because I cannot stand when black people say we are traditional and they don't know that you are hearkening on traditions that do not belong to you. I can't stand it. I've done the research. Argue with your mama because she, she going to argue with you. I'm not going to do it. You are emulating white Eurocentric nucleic families and you can't sell the bullshit past me. You can't. Because once again, I've done the research. There are alternatives that are more effective for the blended families that were created within the black community based upon not only just racism, but the familial breakdowns that occurred during the civil rights era and during the crack era. Play with me. How many of y'all got an uncle or a cousin that's not really your uncle or your cousin? How many of y'all got a sister or brother that's not really your sister or brother? Is that a nucleic family? Or is that a blended family? Do we treat this person any different? Or is this the cousin that I grew up with? Because according to traditional doctrine, that person should be excommunicated we don't always do that that's the reason why once again these roles these perceptions where do they come from where did we learn them from who did we learn them from and why have we not taken the time to re-examine as to whether or not they fit Have we taken the time to examine how it is that they can damage us as well as be constructive? Because once again, if I were to lean into my traditions, the traditions that I was raised in, you take care of women off rip because they bring life. There is no question for that. That's a given. You don't, you, that, that, is, that, is, that is spiritual. That is ordained by God. Because that woman brings life into this world. She is not just protected. See, y'all talk about protecting women as if though they are a stock or an object. When I talk about protecting women, I talk about protecting their realities. Creating safe spaces for them to exist, to thrive, and to grow. When I talk about protecting women, I talk about protecting their autonomy, even if they're not popping out babies. That's African. Why? Because at any point in time, that woman could decide, decide to give life. And what happens at that point? She's going to choose a God. Not a king, not a peon, a God. That is the reason why so many black women are starting to consider polyamory. It has a lot to do, a lot to do with the fact that one is traditional, but also two, there are some men who actually have the range. Y'all just can't conceive that or y'all cannot perceive that because once again, you are stuck in this compulsory monogamy role. Let me ask y'all something. For the people who believe that compulsory monogamy is the only way, how's that working out for you? Once again, it's not a judgment. I'm just asking, how is engaging in that role working out for you? How is subscribing to that perception of person working for you? How is subscribing to that identity solely working for you? The word traditional usually means white. And white is not always right. If you want me to, if you want me to be honest, in the United States, nine times out of ten, white is white is delusional. And I, 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 I promise I don't mean. I promise I don't say that to be like what people would call racist. No, it's factual. Like it's anthropological, 
right? If you go into the APA's chronology of the United States, if you go into, once again, uh, how it is that they conceptualize drapedomania, if you go into any hospital before the 1950s, how it is that they talked about mental health, if you go, man, the way that they talk about women and we lay in the bed with them all the time, what? Y'all can't tell me it's not delusional, G. Do any do any thorough study of the United States, how it is that we conceptualize conceptualize knowledge specifically in the United States, not in Europe. Because that's see, that's how they get you. They blend European history with American history as if though we was all doing the same thing. No, we wasn't. No, we were not. The people on this side of the Atlantic Ocean was dumb as hell. The people on this side of the Atlantic Ocean was dumb as hell. And they didn't start becoming more intelligent until after there was more routes established between Europe and the United States. Please do not let these people fool you. Please don't. Please don't. What if everyone doesn't have the capacity to be polyamorous? I'm not saying that you need to have the capacity to be polyamorous. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that in the space of attempting to hold on to a role or attempting to hold on to a schema, or the attempt to hold on to what it is that we perceive to be the appropriate way to behave as a man or a woman. My question is, where are you getting that information from? Where are you getting that information from? Why are you so invested in saying to somebody else that their method of doing it is incorrect? If that's the case, where are we getting the correct version from? Who is the author of said correct version? Where is the correct version of manhood and womanhood? Where does it come from? I would like to know the author of said book. I would like to see footnotes. I would like to see citations. Where is it? Where is the normal man? Where is the normal woman? Usually when we talk about normal, we are, we are talking about an ideal. And an ideal for a lot of individual people is your conceptualization filled in with what it is that you would have liked to happen in a traumatic situation in a conglomerate placed into a mold. You push it out, that's your ideal partner. I'm going to say it one more time. Your ideal partner, I don't give a fuck if you're a man, I don't give a damn if you're a woman, gay, straight, doesn't matter. Your ideal partner usually, usually is a combination of what you identify to be traditional, what you identify to be quote unquote normal based upon your experiences and gap fill ins with where it is that you would have liked something to happen in a traumatic situation. <coughs> Put a little sprinkle sprinkle on what it is that you prefer in terms of physicality and you have your ideal partner. That's the reason why in one of my episodes I said you look for what you lack. I need somebody to complete me. You need somebody to fill in them trauma holes. You need somebody to help you co-regulate. You need somebody to hold you at night. Not because you're lonely, but because your brain releases oxytocin, uh, oxytocin when you touch somebody. It's literally a regulator. But because, once again, you as a man believe that you should just struggle by yourself. Now you out here dysregulated, discombobulated, and dick dislocated. Look at that. As a woman, now you out here believing that ain't no man worth your time, whole time. You don't give no man the time of day. Why? Because you believe that the emotional pool completely belongs to you. That's that patriarchal femininity, baby. That shit stank. Just cut that out. I've met too. I've met too many women, too many, who want to have the lion's share of emotional space in a relationship. I've met too many. I've met too many women who do not want to be with a quote-unquote emotional man. Yeah, because you ain't got the tools to deal with one. Right? 
my man's trip Fontaine on the tonight's pod, the, the, the night show, the, 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 the tonight's, the tonight's conversation podcast. This man said, y'all want an emotionally intelligent man until it is a reality. Then y'all recognize that you have not had emo enough emotionally intelligent men to deal with this man. Ladies, most of y'all first first man, first good man fumble was the first emotionally intelligent man that you ran into. The first good man that you usually fumbled was the emotionally intelligent man. The first one that you ran into. Right? So what does this mean? Y'all give me a second. I got to check my messages. All right, we good. We Gucci. So, I say all that to say, the expectations of the patriarchy, the expectations of traditional masculinity, the expectation of these gender roles damages both sides. It sincerely does. It makes finding relationships difficult on both sides. It does. Why? Because once again, I ask my clients all the time, do you check your expectations? Do you check your relationship expectations? Do you really? Do you understand why you have these relationship expectations? And if so, are you honest? Do you consensually communicate? In other words, do you let, do you know, do you let people know what they signing up for? Or do you attempt to present a more polished version of yourself and then lie and say that you can maintain that polish? Nah, somebody just caught you on a, a manic upswing. They ain't seen you in your depressive state yet. Or no, they caught you on a, a good regulation week. What happens when you become dysregulated? I keep trying to tell y'all, everybody has trauma. Black, pe black people, black people, if I, if I remember the statistic correctly, it's either four times or 14 more times. It might have been one of them times I was like, no, nah, that 14 can't be right, so it got to be four. But it's four, 14 more. No, I think it's four times more likely to experience trauma before the age of 14. Black people are four times more likely to experience trauma before the age of 14. So how do you have the audacity to say that I don't want to deal with nobody that's too emotional? You don't mess around and get somebody who's nonchalant as a trauma response. Now you upset because they won't talk to you. Listen. Listen. The gender roles that we engage in in the black community usually overlook trauma that is very specific to the black community. The gender roles that we expect from the black community, from black men and black women, overlook Trauma that is specific to the black community. So, for example, how are you going to expect this woman to immediately be vulnerable to you when the last three men that she didn't engage with all been black and all been crazy? Well, oh, that's not my responsibility, brother. That's not my point. Your expectations need to be checked. Your reality needs to be checked. Oh, that's lowering my standards. No, it's not. It's adjusting yourself to be more empathetic when you see it and understand how to navigate it within yourself. Because I can guarantee that it's something on you that stank the same way to somebody else and you try to cover it up when they smell it on you. It's trauma. Trauma rots. Trauma, in, trauma intoxicates. But once again, if you carrying these bags... In these bags, if you got trauma, that trauma's going to stank. It just is. That is the nature of trauma. Right? But we as black folk are more, more likely to have these bags. So then how do, how do we as black people then come to this whole idea of, oh, I want you to come to me healed? We live in communities where we're four times more likely to experience trauma. That literally means that if I'm walking down the road, I'm four times more likely to get stole on than somebody else. I could get stole on on the way to your house. I come in your crib and you expected me to be healed. I just, I just, got, I just got stole on. 
So I can't dysregulate in front of you because I'm a man. I can't, I can't, my voice can't escalate without me screaming at you. I just, I just can't be like loud and upset. I got to be a man in that situation. Right? With black men and black women. Dr. Umar said it best. He was like, black men are so focused on the fact that black women are outdoing us economically that they overlook the fact that they are still experiencing the same things that we do racially. Once again, you so focused on this woman having this education. You so focused on this woman having this intellect. You so focused on this woman having money. Brother, that is how African queens moved. I keep trying to tell y'all, y'all want black women to be white women so bad, and they're not. Black women always going to go get it. But once again, because you are operating from this lens of traditional masculine ideology that says you have to be the head of the household and you being the head of the household means that you make the most money and you control all of the bills and you make sure every, everything go the way that it needs to go. So now, because you're not in that position, you want to be pissy and you want to piss all over everything. Boy, what? Instead of regulating yourself, joining with this woman, talking about what it is that she wants to do, assisting her on this journey, getting her to trust you with your, once again, showing a track record of your ability to engage in particular financial, particular financial investments that will allow that money to grow. No. Nah. She make more money than me. As a black man. What to be there your problem? Eh? But once again, once again, then we start talking about, oh, it's the system, X, Y, and Z. I hear that, brother. I hear that. And, and, and. For a lot of us as black men, we are culpable in allowing other people to manipulate us into behaving aggressively to prove a masculinity that's going to make you a fucking slave. You are literally willing to give up your freedom in order to be a man? Whew, you just got bamboozled. You just got finessed. So what you telling me is that in order for you to be a in order for you to be a man you go to jail and care nothing about it you a slave as soon as as soon as you hit that door as soon as you hit the door you are a slave to the state when you get that's the reason why that is the reason why once again them going back to that 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 cycle of them going back to prison is so high that's the reason why the reentry is so high but good people, great people, God's people, I got to hop off. I got a client to see. Listen, in closing, I want to leave y'all with this. We have to learn how to break down these gender roles. We have to learn how to criticize where it is that these roles come from. We have to learn how to deeply examine what these things mean as it relates to how it is that it impacts us in our relationship, we have to see and truly dig into how it is that we've internalized these things and made it difficult for us to seek the partners that we are truly looking for. So once again, good people, great people, guys, people, thank you for joining me in this space. Peace, love, soul, butter rolls. I'll see y'all next time. Also on the UB2B.